This is the longer video on cellular respiration covering the material we're covering in class. For a faster video, use the five minute metabolism. After this lecture, you should be able to define substrate, product, catabolism, anabolism, glycolysis, citric acid cycle, electron transport chain, oxidative phosphorylation, and fermentation. Be able to draw the steps of both glycolysis and electron transport. Let's loosely be able to do it. I do not expect you to learn the names of every intermediate and protein. List the inputs and outputs of glycolysis, the transition step, the citric acid cycle, and the electron transport chain, including oxidative phosphorylation. And be able to relate glycolysis, the citric acid cycle, and electron transport to one another, as well as to respiration in general, including oxygen. Let's start off by talking about the principles. So some basic principles of metabolism are what we call things and how they work. For example, cells will turn what we call substrates into what we call products through a chemical reaction. So turning oxygen, O2, and 4H plus into 2H2O is turning substrates into products. And the products would be H2O and the substrates would be H plus and O2. We have two different types of metabolism we're going to talk about. One is anabolism, which builds up molecules. Making starch out of glucose is anabolic. Making a protein out of amino acids is anabolic. There is also catabolism, which breaks down molecules. Breaking down glucose into CO2 is a catabolic reaction. Breaking down a protein into amino acids is a catabolic reaction. Generally, anabolism is going to require additional energy inputs. Generally, catabolism is going to give off energy. And we will be able to couple these two. And this is what ATP is used for. And this is why ATP is cellular currency. Because when we do something like cellular respiration, which is a catabolic reaction, we give off energy, and that energy can be harvested and put into ATP. The ATP can later release the energy into other, other processes which can do cellular work, such as anabolic reactions, transport of things, or muscle contraction. This makes ATP an energy intermediate and currency by which different transactions within a cell can be coupled. We're specifically talking about glucose catabolism when we talk about cellular respiration. Now, glucose can be burned in a fire to give off both heat and light. If you doubt this, next time you have a fire, just pour some sugar on me and pour some sugar on it, and you'll see that it pretty much explodes. This is combustion, where glucose is turned very rapidly into CO2 and H2O. Glucose can also be broken down in distinct steps to give off discrete amounts of energy at each one of those steps. And this is metabolism, specifically cellular respiration. And cellular respiration is going to have several steps. There is glycolysis, where we turn that glucose molecule into 2-pyruvate, and we harvest energy from that transition. There is a transition state, where we turn pyruvate into acetyl-CoA, and we harvest energy from that transition. There is a citric acid cycle where we break down acetyl-CoA into CO2 and we harvest energy from that transition. And then there is the electron transport chain where we use the energy harvested from the prior three steps to make ATP. First off, glycolysis. Glycolysis is going to break glucose down into 2-pyruvate. So you'll see that I'm going to track the carbons and then I'm going to track other molecules. So glucose goes in and is converted into several other molecules and eventually into two pyruvate and, of course, two water molecules. But we're not really tracking the water here, just the carbons which are in pyruvate. There is an energy investment phase where you take two ATP and an energy payoff phase where you get four ATP. You get, as well, two NADH from that energy payoff, which requires you to put in two NAD+, plus, which are low energy molecules. NAD+, plus is low energy. NADH is high energy. So your net reaction is two ATP, four ADP, two NAD+, plus, and you get two ADP, 
for ATP and 2NADH out of this. What do we do with that ATP? We use it for any other cellular work. What do we do with that NADH? We hold on to it for a little while and we'll talk about it later. Now, we have two pyruvate molecules that can be further broken down. These pyruvate molecules will go into the mitochondrion through the transition reaction. You see, pyruvate doesn't simply barge into the mitochondrion. No, it must first be turned into acetyl-CoA through the transition reaction. So this is where we get pyruvate turning into CO2, we break off a carbon, and acetyl-CoA, a two-carbon molecule with coenzyme A attached to it. Coenzyme A is, of course, a B vitamin. This will also allow us to harvest energy and use NAD, NAD plus to harvest some electrons, and high energy electrons they are, and make NADH. What happens to this NADH? We'll set it aside for later. And this is going to, this acetyl-CoA is now going to enter something else. The citric acid cycle. The citric acid cycle will use this acetyl-CoA and will attach it to a pre-existing molecule. And then through a series of steps, it'll regenerate that pre-existing molecule and burn off 2CO2. So you start with an acetyl-CoA and you end with 2CO2, and that's where the carbon goes. So we have now tracked all the carbon from that starting glucose molecule and it is now CO2, which is exhaled. We also get energy in the form of ATP, which means we need to take one ADP, we need one FAD, and three NAD+. These are low energy molecules. The citric acid cycle will give us one ATP, three NADH, and one FADH2. The ATP, we can use it for whatever. The NADH and FADH2, we're going to set aside and use them later. It's later. And we're now looking at the electron transport chain. The electron transport chain will take high energy electrons off of molecules that have high energy electrons and will move them into a lower energy state. These molecules with high energy electrons are NADH and FADH2. So the electron transport chain, proteins in it will remove electrons from NADH and FADH2, first off at NADH, which is going to have a higher energy electron, and next at FADH2, which is going to have a lower energy electron and will transfer a little lower down. And you can see the series of steps here where you start with high energy and you move down through each protein or complex to a lower and lower energy state ending here on water. We'll get to that in a moment. At each time that a, an electron passes through one of these integral proteins, H+, also known as protons, are being pumped through, using active transport, this membrane. Now, the active transport here does not actually use ATP. It uses the energy from the high-energy electrons to pump protons across this inner membrane of the mitochondria. Okay. So we end up with a higher level of protons in that intermembrane space than we do on the inside of the mitochondria. Well, where do the electrons end up? Well, they end up on water. And what happens here is within the mitochondria, oxygen is used. Oxygen will bind to, bond to hydrogen and use those electrons to make H2O. The final electron acceptor is oxygen in the form of water here. And this is why oxygen is needed for cellular respiration. Oxygen is the final electron acceptor in the form of water there. So this is why you need to breathe in a short way. And this is why we call this oxidative. Now we also say that there's oxidative phosphorylation. Where does the phosphorylation come in? That is where you take a DP and turn it into ATP by allowing protons through a molecule called ATP synthase. ATP synthase allows protons through the inner membrane of the mitochondrion, and as it lets them through, it basically cranks like a pepper turner and will put together ADP and a phosphate to make high-energy ATP. And this is where most of the ATP is going to be formed. 
in this phosphorylation of ADP that is related to the oxidative presence of, well, oxygen. So this is oxidative phosphorylation, which occurs at the end of the electron transport chain. So let's think about this connecting it together. It may be your figure 336, or it may be another one, depending on what version of the book you have, but you should be able to draw this roughly from memory. Glycolysis takes one glucose and turns it to two pyruvate. The preparatory or transition step makes that pyruvate into acetyl-CoA. The acetyl-CoA goes into the citric acid cycle where CO2 is the end product for those carbons. In glycolysis, you have negative two ATP to initiate glycolysis, the energy investment phase, and positive four ATP to, well, that's where you get in the energy payoff phase. And of course, glycolysis gives off two NADH. The preparatory step will give off two NADH, one for each pyruvate. The citric acid cycle will give off two ATP and six NADH, three for each pyruvate. It'll also give off two FADH, two, one for each pyruvate. So what happens here is you end up with all of those NADHs and FADH2 going to electron transport chain and oxidative phosphorylation to make most of the ATP in about 34 ATP, depending on conditions, to make a total of about 36 ATP. That's a lot of ATP, but most of it requires the presence of oxygen. So is it just sugar? No, it's not just sugar. Fats can be broken down into glycerol, which can be broken down into pyruvate. Fatty acids can be broken down directly into acetyl-CoA. Glycogen gets broken down into glucose. Okay, we know where that goes. Proteins get broken down into amino acids, which can be forming a carbon backbone and can either go directly into the citric acid cycle or can be converted into acetyl-CoA or can go into pyruvate. This, of course, requires the deamination of these, and you get a little uh, NH3, which goes into urea or waste. So as you see, fats, glycogen, and protein can all give off energy and can all be burnt in the furnace of the mitochondria. But what if there is no oxygen? Well, that will lead to fermentation. Fermentation is what happens when there is no oxygen, which means that there is low NAD+. There's low NAD+, because the NADH cannot give off its electrons because there's no ultimate electron acceptor. So there's a backlog of NADH, and therefore there is X, there's no NAD+, or very low NAD+. You may remember, hopefully, NAD+, is needed for glycolysis. So glycolysis cannot move forward in the absence of NAD+. So how do you restore that NAD+. Well, you use pyruvate, and NADH will go to pyruvate to make lactate. And NADH will be giving up its protons and be returned to NAD+, which allows glycolysis to move forward. Unfortunately, that means that NADH cannot be used in the oxidative phosphorylation and the electron transport chain. Nope, it just gets burnt up to make lactate. It also means that glucose now has a lower energy yield. It also means that the lactate will build up. Now, if you're yeast, this is, this is actually alcohol, ethanol really, but since you're not yeast, you make lactate, which is converted to lactic acid, which burns. So when you're feeling the burn, remember you're fermenting and that is suboptimal. What your body needs is oxygen to be an ultimate electron acceptor to take those electrons from the electron transport chain, which takes them from NADH, and that NADH coming, of course, from the citric acid cycle, the transition step, and glycolysis. It's all connected, and it's all needing oxygen. So breathe deeply, my friends. Take notes, and make sure you get this topic, because, oh boy, it's a bit of a doozy.